<clears throat> Brilliant, thanks. I should also say before I get started, I'm just recovering from uh, losing my voice. So if I suddenly start coughing um, in the middle of the presentation, then don't be too alarmed. Um, apologies for that. Um, but hopefully it's it's on the mend now. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to be talking about over the next 40 minutes or so uh, are very long run trajectories of um, vulnerability to drought in uh, Mozambique, well, mostly Mozambique, but also neighboring areas of, of southeastern Africa, um, northern Zimbabwe, eastern Zimbabwe, as well as bits of Zambia uh, as well. Um, and the focus is mostly going to be on the pre 19th century, early 19th century period. Um, what I've begun to do is, is sort of connect those questions um, that I've been exploring to more recent um uh debates questions around food security climate change adaptation um that's the more sort of formative prelim preliminary elements of, of this that i'm going to present um but nonetheless i think um it's it's obviously really important to to consider that um with such a topic so a bit of context gets straight into it um from that recent period um, are the, the, the hazards that um, Mozambique and Southeastern Africa is uh, exposed to. Um, in the top left, the two maps here, you can see the um, uh, effects um, in terms of the, uh, the, the drought conditions that were present in February 2016 and the uh, subsequent food insecurity uh, classifications according to the IPC um, uh, scale. And this was one of the uh, severest droughts that we've had um, in Southern Africa for, for quite some time. Um, and of course, more recently as well in, in, in 2020, um, we've had uh, sort of similar scale, at least um, uh, drought conditions. Um, but what's notable here is, is um, that, that at least half of Mozambique in terms of its land area um, was classified as being in crisis conditions uh, and partly stressed as well. Um, the northern part of the country experiences sometimes uh, different climatic conditions um, and was not as, as badly affected. Um, on the right, you see from 2019 um, a, a satellite image of, um, of, of uh, Cyclone Idai, um, which occurred in close succession with uh, Cyclone Kenneth in the same year. Um, and this had devastating effects on um, on uh, households, on homes, infrastructure, um, and in Mozambique alone, um, 110,000 house, houses were destroyed, um, over a thousand killed as well um, in, in Cyclone Idai, <coughs> particularly around the city of, uh, of Byra. And um, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the, the kinds of uh, longer term uh, local and traditional uh, coping adaptive capacities that societies and communities within um, the modern day area of Mozambique and, and its neighboring countries have um, developed over time. Um, many parts of the country are, are um, both highly exposed and vulnerable to these kind of uh, climatic extreme events. Moving forward, um, at least if we if we look into the, uh, the IPCC sixth assessment report um, and the, the, the kind of summary uh, data they have on, on uh, Africa as a whole and, and um, Eastern Southern Africa here in this uh, region that you see on the right. Uh, we can see that mean annual pre precipitation <coughs> is, is, is gonna have varied effects um, under all of the, the warming scenarios displayed here, um, 1.5 at the top, 4 at the bottom. Um, but by and large, in, in, in southeastern Africa, we're looking at um, under 1.5 degrees of warming um, between sort of 0 to 10% to uh, decrease in, in annual total precipitation and in the, the 4 degree um, warming, uh, a lot more significant um, uh, and, and pronounced reductions in mean annual rainfall. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, annual maximum daily precipitation, so extreme concentrations of precipitation in a short space of time, 
are, are projected to uh, rise and, and with that comes um, increased exposures to, to flooding um, and related hazards as well. So some important context um, to, to get us started there. What I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is um, I'm going to structure it in, in four components. Um, very briefly, I'm just going to outline the key sort of arguments that I've, I've come to um, having been sort of active in this, in this research field for, for a decade or so now. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk about climate history in, in Southern Africa. Um, what, what have um, climate historians been, been uh, doing by and large and where are the, the sort of gaps and challenges that uh, remain. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to be discussing some recent work that I've been doing around the history of food systems, um, which I've only recently begun to start connecting um, in, in a sort of systematic manner to um, my other research and, and uh, the research of others on, on the sort of climate history um, elements of the region. <clears throat> and then fourthly, I'm going to connect that, um, or, or rather maybe pull out some, some sort of key context that we can um, glean from this uh, sort of deep, deeper historical work um, around um, modern food insecurity and, and related to that uh, climate change adaptation too. So the key arguments that I'd like to make, <clears throat> um, first of all, um, and, and this is not a new argument, um, um, at, at least from my part, um, with respect to uh, Southeastern Africa, is that resilience rather than breakdown was the um, observed norm during these anomalously dry seasons, um, especially in, in individual uh, seasons of, of uh, rainfall deficiencies, but even some of the back-to-back -back ones as well. So um, two years of drought um, occasionally um, more than that too. Droughts of longer duration, on the other hand, three to five years, which were much less frequent, were more disruptive, although the, those, those effects played out um, uh, differently according to, to different vulnerability contexts. The second one um, <clears throat> is something that I'm going to try and draw out as we go through, which is that um, food systems had an important role to play and food cultures related to that as well in um, explaining those patterns of drought impact, um, their degree of significance or their degree of uh, their, their sort of relative importance in doing so may be contested, but that, that, took, for, that took the form of um, both adaptability in food systems um, in, in embracing new crops in uh, rapid responses to, to new uh, market opportunities but also in resistance in, in sort of maintaining um, dietary patterns and also in, um, in, in, in maintaining uh, coping mechanisms, um, at least throughout the, the earlier part of the period that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> and then, then finally, I'll, I'll talk about how that's, that's relevant for, for questions of food security and climate change adaptation. Uh, and obviously I'm arguing that, that there are um, relevant discussion points here. Uh, just to begin with, <clears throat> if we if we draw back to one of the most uh, recent protracted periods of climatic change um, in in uh, well global history, it has been argued, but um, uh, I am arguing in in southeastern African history as well is is this period called the Little Ice Age. Um, it, it has been contested whether this has had a global imprint um, and uh, whether it was it was um, a, a, a real phenomenon in the southern hemisphere as well as the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> but at least if we look at the records that do exist uh, from paleoclimate sources, um, quite reliant on things like cave speleotherms as well as lake records here, but in, in the African context and the Southern African context on the right here, we, we, we do see um, decreases in temperature from approximately um, 1600 to 1800, maybe slightly earlier to slightly later in some of those other records as well. <clears throat> so certainly in terms of temperature, we, we do see a, a, um, a, a decrease, particularly around that, that sort of late 17th, early 18th century, um, as is shown um, 
here in the middle. Um, <clears throat> what is it equally, if not uh, much more important to consider in the African context and the Southeast African context is the effects of these changes on rainfall variability. Um, and there's a huge amount of um, wiggly lines here, um, which uh, the significance of each of those isn't isn't the the, the point of, of what I'm going to discuss, but actually the whole the, the, the sort of um, sum of all of those records is that we we can see patterns starting to emerge <clears throat> in in the the rainfall signals um, of the Little Ice Age period in in this region, um, the region that is the box um, on this left hand map um, labeled Southeast Africa, and those symbols are where the the records come from, uh, shown on the right hand graphs. And if we look on the far right hand graph, um, we can see that certainly for most of these records, again, between sort of 1600 to <clears throat> 1750, at least longer in some records, um, earlier in others, we can see that conditions were um, anomalously uh, dry. Uh, that, that's not to say that variability between year to year and decade to, to decade was higher um, <clears throat> than, than previous times that were that were um, on average wetter we don't unfortunately have the, the um, sufficient high resolution records to actually test that proposition but certainly um, in terms of longer term change and longer term uh, baseline conditions we can see a, a drying in the region over that period <clears throat> and the tendency in the um, paleoclimate literature in some of the archaeological literature has been to make these kind of sweeping connections between um, moments, periods of societal change, um, most notably in the case of the collapse of, uh, or alleged collapse, abandonment, whichever words um, is, is preferable, um, of societies like Mapungubwe um, in the Limpopo Valley, like Great Zimbabwe in, in um, southwestern, southeastern Zimbabwe, sorry, um, and uh, uh, various other societies across uh, the region at various points in time. Now, predominantly that has related to um, case studies, societies which we, we don't have a uh, written record or a contemporary written record of. So this has been inferred largely, as you see in the bottom left quote, on coincidence between these uh, climatic changes and um, chronologies um, in a loose sense. Um, there has been a, a sort of um, reframing of that narrative, um, particularly by African archaeologists, um, Manyanga in particular, um, Chirikuri as well, with his work on, on Great Zimbabwe, which has questioned some of the, <coughs> excuse me, simplistic narratives that have, have flown from taking paleoclimate records and inferring that, <coughs> that sort of causal link there and and that's been that's been uh, a really important element of of um, sort of pushing back and reframing this narrative of the last decade or so. But but actually, surprisingly, little <clears throat> had been written on uh, later periods, despite the existence of written records. And this this the, the field that most closely aligns with, with um, this line of research is uh, known as climate history, it's known as historical climatology, it's also recently known as the history of climate and society, um, uh, as, as uh, Dagmar de Groot and, and colleagues have um, advanced in, in a recent article. And, and broadly speaking, according to uh, Rudolf Brasdil and colleagues, um, this or these fields, um, whichever, whichever name you prefer, um, looks at reconstructing past patterns of weather and climate from um, written records, mostly prior to the creation of national meteorological records uh, networks. <coughs> it looks at the vulnerability of past societies to climate variations and extremes, and it also explores past discourses and social representations of climate. And this was something very much um, lacking in the region um, in, a, in a sort of overt sense. It had been um, uh, a, a sort of partial focus of economic history um, and, and other, other sort of subfields of history um, elements of archaeology as well. But actually, um, the, the focus 
until um, a decade or so ago was largely around this, this um, issue of collapse. But over, over the last um, two decades, I suppose, um, work by David Nash, by Georgina Renfield, um, Colleen Vogel, um, Sharon Nicholson and others <coughs> um, has begun to extend those meteorological records that we have, which are mostly from the late 19th century, early 20th century onward, back to the early mid part of the 19th century. So we have these much longer chronologies now of um, rainfall variability at um, an, an annual and seasonal resolution starting to appear in much greater number um, across Southern Africa, um, albeit not Mozambique just yet. Um, and, and there's still significant gaps that, that remain in the sort of non-Anglophone um, sphere as well. <clears throat> but until recently, um, not much had been done in a systematic sense with the earlier documentary evidence that exists. Um, and as you see in, in the top left, um, Mozambique, um, the northern fringes of, of modern day Zimbabwe, were areas that do have a, a deeper written record owing to the um, presence of uh, Portuguese colonists um, and later the, the, the Dutch and French. <coughs> um, and and as, as in other parts of, of um, Africa as a whole, um, there have been attempts to, to gather um, records of, of or, or mentions rather of, of, of drought and, and extreme rainfall conditions from these um, areas which you see um, shaded in black where, where there are um, at least European documentary source coverages. <coughs> there have been various attempts to, to sort of uh, create, if not um, as highly resolved chronologies of, of past extreme events, but, but chronologies nonetheless. Though again, Mozambique was not one of the areas that has featured in, in this work um, until relatively recently. <coughs> if we look at the types of evidence that exists to actually explore these questions, um, well, there, there are various types. The quantity varies enormously from, from decade to decade. Um, though as a whole over, over sort of the 1500 to 1840 period, we, there is a relative consistency um, with, albeit with some um, uh, poorly represented decades and others quite well represented. Um, but most of these accounts are, are narrative accounts. <coughs> so the information within them is, is uh, qualitative by and large, apart from a few um, sort of more diary type entries where you get recordings of, of wind direction, rainfall and so on. And the authors behind these sources were, were largely um, a mixture of missionaries, colonial officials, traveler diarists of various um, backgrounds, traders, chroniclers, um, and naval officers as well. Um, and there is, I wouldn't say an abundance, but there is um, uh, a steady flow of information on, on various drought events that have, have uh, been um, uh, at least thought significant enough to be recorded over this uh, time frame, and a few of those we can sort of see um, on the screen. And that the type of recording that, that took place was um, generally structured around, there was, there was a drought in, in the land of um, X in 1758, um, and the effects were a great famine, abandonment of settlements and so on. <coughs> That's pretty much the standards um, we get, um, as well as some evidence of um, coping and adaptation strategies coming through too. So what I've what I've been doing over the past um, few years <coughs> is collating this evidence. Um, and it, it's I don't claim this to be exhaustive, <coughs> but I, I, I certainly think we're reaching the point where um, diminishing returns have been reached in terms of effort put into um, very deep archival explorations of, of um, uh, finding new data and um, maybe one or two more being added from, from the data that exists. <clears throat> and from across this period, 1550 to 1830, um, I classified 68 uh, rain years as either dry or wet and also got um, locust outbreaks here as well. And with, uh, within those <coughs> events, there are nine multi-year dry periods that were recorded. 
which tend to cluster around the, the sort of late seventh, uh, late 16th century and the um, 18th century as a whole slash early 19th century. Not much um, you'll note in the, the, the driest um, part of the Little Ice Age, as we see here, although again, I stress that, that much of the data that we have does not allow us to, to read off variability between year to year, date, decade to get to decade, because it's, it's simply too low resolution. <clears throat> um, those those multi-year dry periods were sometimes accompanied by mortality. <clears throat> but what the evidence suggests is that this typically arose due to a mixture of causes, um, chief amongst which were conflict and epidemics. Although with epidemics, it is often hard to tell whether they preceded or followed um, those dry seasons uh, or dry events. And this has been something that's been noted by, by um, others like uh, Pikirai um, from, from um, a few decades ago. <clears throat> and also, um, as, I, as I said in one of my key arguments, there is very little evidence of these single season or very localized droughts um, coinciding with or causing severe uh, social impacts. <clears throat> in fact, I showed one of the exceptions to that um, apparent rule in um, the previous slide where, where um, a, a mine was abandoned by, by the Portuguese um, who had a very small presence um, in, in um, the area of southern Zambia um, and were, were reliant basically on, on very limited options of, of accessing food. So vulnerability context is really important here, but on the whole, <coughs> there, there's very little evidence across this nearly three century period of those single season droughts causing very se severe social impacts. Of course, that's not to say that that didn't exist, but the sources certainly suggest um, that. <coughs> the reasons that have typically been um, <coughs> attributed to, <coughs> excuse me, um, so these kinds of patterns are, um, are various. And I think one of the most important of these has been the, the sort of presence, um, maybe even dominance of drought resistant grains, particularly sorghum, um, but also um, indigenous grains like the uh, Bambara groundnut as well, uh, legumes, sorry, not grains. Um, various uh, types of um, cropping, intercropping, uh, flood recession cultivation um, and wetland cultivation as well. <coughs> Grain storage of which there's um, quite a nice quote from Antonio Gomez there, um, which uh, David Beach estimated a, a sort of period of two to three years for storing um, sorghum and millets, although that's been somewhat disputed at the higher or lower end, um, but I think it's generally a, a reasonable um, estimate. Um, grain storage beyond the sort of household and village level, but also at the, the sort of central um, uh, state or <coughs> uh, chieftaincy level. Um, so harvest from common fields could have been stored in, um, chief, in, in chief's granaries and then redistributed in times of uh, scarcity. Um, cooperative um, systems in, in uh, agriculture. Uh, for example, weeding and, and threshing of grain, also uh, borrowing grain uh, and, and uh, paying it back without interest over seasons. And then the, the importance of hunting, gathering and fishing, um, which, which were important um, in, in many areas, um, some more than others, as we, we might see um, in a few slides time. One of the issues with um, this is that with these arguments valid though they are is that they're often not so much advanced in terms of a chronology um so things like changes over time particularly with um varying pressures from from uh, colonialism um uh slavery and and, and other related factors um, and there have been relatively few systematic studies of <coughs> um how these types of patterns have, have changed over time and what their sort of relative importance has been, um, particularly comparing it to, to the, the kind of drought chronologies that I've um, shown in previous slides. 
Um, this is where some work that I've recently been uh, conducting comes in. <clears throat> and this is work that has sort of branched off from the past global changes pages, um, land use 6K, land cover 6K project, um, of which I was part of the African uh, working group. Um, and what I've really been doing since, uh, at least since the, the sort of first COVID lockdown period, um, if not before then, is again collating, compiling um, both published and unpublished documentary evidence, but also cartographic evidence, drawing on some uh, linguistic studies as well, <coughs> of um, the presence or absence of foodstuffs across um, not only Mozambique, but actually larger parts of Eastern Africa as a whole, largely as you see on the right, this sort of coastal area, um, but, but extending inland up the Zambezi into, um, into Eastern Zambia, parts of Zimbabwe, Malawi as well. Um, and across 279 sites in this region across the period 1497 to 1840. Um, <clears throat> those sites, as I'll explain, have been identified from uh, various sources, um, including uh, geo-reference maps, um, sites still in existence today, um, on the more uh, basic side from, from descriptions provided by um, uh, writers. Um, but importantly, this, this does not stop at the, just simply the presence or absence of foodstuffs. What I've attempted to do here is supplement this with um, qualitative information on the quantity of, of foodstuffs in different areas, the relative importance, of course, through, through um, the, the sort of lens of, of, of colonial writers by and large, um, but also things like production methods, whether that be rain-fed cultivation, um, uh, flood recession, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and this really draws upon um, what Davidson has called the breadth and depth method in big qualitative data. Um, which has allowed um, me to sort of combine perspectives on the materiality of foodstuffs with the more sort of social cultural perspectives on um, diets, on um, relative importance of foodstuffs, on um, commercial crops, um, and uh, so on and so forth. And you can also see across the bottom the kind of um, temporal um, density of. of the uh, data across that period. <clears throat> the workflow for this project, very briefly, um, started out, of course, by searching for, for the, the relevant data sets um, and documents. Um, but as we get into uh, identifying foodstuffs and transcribing this other information, that's where there's slightly more caveats in terms of um, looking at um, sort of older names for, for crops, um, particularly the Portuguese um, milio, which was assumed to be maize once upon a time um, for the going right back to the early period, but actually um, historical work has shown that represents uh, sorghum. So there has been um, a number of different steps that have had to be uh, sort of gone through to, to reach this database um, becoming anywhere near usable. Um, and then also, categorizing that other information um, here shown in the orange. So those, these colors on the right broadly relate to uh, the, the flow chart on the left. Um, so the, the food stuff in this case, um, quite easily identifiable um, as cassava. Um, and the supplementary information here on um, production methods, um, which in the case of cassava were, were very much um, um, uh, rapid and significant. Um, to, to production systems because of the, the kinds of processes that, that cassava um, needs to go through before it's, it's um, consumable. <coughs> and also the um, types of preparation methods and so forth, um, as well as um, location information and uh, temporal information. So this, this kind of um, work, although there's not information on, on relative importance for all of these observations has yielded um, a large data set which um, we can start to use to actually look at historical patterns of um, uh, crop cultivation, which is um, needless to say is one of the main um, economic activities, one of the main livelihoods in, in um, harm's way of, 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 of climate. And also to, to look at um, the, the more sort of socio-cultural perspectives behind 
um, changes and uh, resistance to changes in um, in the relative importance of those different crops. And from this, I, I've, I've started to draw out, and I, I must stress that all of this is still um, unpublished and also um, somewhat preliminary, um, some patterns in these um, observations. And what we can see on the right, and, and I'll show the, the sort of chronological perspective on this in a minute, but this simply is, is the whole data set. So from 1500 or 1497 to, to 1840, is that sorghum was not just um, an important crop, it was, it was <clears throat> almost uh, ubiquitous. And this was not just in, in dryland areas as, as um, it, it is often assumed today, um, where sorghum has this advantage, but actually it was, it was cultivated um, at the vast majority of sites within the data set. Um, millet had something more of a, a sort of geographically um, uh, constrained pattern, um, a, a sort of south of the Zambezi, or, although not entirely, south of the Delta, um, and, and the, the sort of coastal areas down into um, the modern day Eastern Cape of, of South Africa. Um, rice, um, also quite widespread, <clears throat> but again, not just confined to um, coastal areas um, or even very wet areas. We have evidence of um, wetland cultivation inland as well and, and uh, flood recession cultivation there too. <clears throat> and the uh, wheat and the American crops, I'll, I'll come back to those um, in a second. Um, accompanying that in, in the, the qualitative data is um, some key evidence here on, on, on resistance to the uptake of, of new uh, staples, well not new necessarily, but um, certainly in the case of wheat um, and uh, rice in some areas as well, um, which, which sort of rose to prominence in, in, in the coastal areas um, on the Swahili coast from um, the sort of 11th century onwards. But there was still resistance to um, uh, adopting these crops as, as dietary staples um, as, as late as the uh, early 17th century and uh, not especially late for wheat but for rice certainly um, and the, the, the reasons why um, the reasons why are quite illuminating here in that um, sorghum according to Santos was considered more substantial and, and strengthening um, and in the Zambezi Valley, Gomez reported that um, Africans say that um, wheat and rice are very light and only the others, sorghum millet, touch their heart. And there's, there's various other lines of evidence here of, of this kind of resistance towards um, the adoption of new staple crops, if not necessarily in the, their cultivation um, to access um, different market opportunities or, or, or sort of consumption as, as uh, dietary supplements. And chronologically, just for a subset of these uh, areas that I've looked at, um, and uh, Mozambique here on, on the chart on the right refers to the area around Mozambique Island, not the, the, the country as a whole. <coughs> um, but, but this also suggests that, that sorghum um, remained relatively dominant until at least the 18th century, longer in some areas like um, Tet in the Zambezi Valley, um, which is a um, rather drier parts of, of Mozambique. Um, but, but certainly if we look, uh, obviously there's a lot of data displayed in here. Um, if we look into other areas, we can see that um, wheat becomes much more widely cultivated or intensely cultivated um, in around Kualimani, which was one of the um, key um, ports where, where grains were exported from. Um, and we can sort of see shifts um, at, at the bottom at least um, qualitatively from these uh, staple trajectories in, in some areas away from sorghum um, after this sort of late 18th century period. Um, I'll talk about the flip side of that in, in a second. <clears throat> away from food systems but related is the um, kinds of coping and adaptation strategies that accompanied um, uh, food storage, food redistribution, food availability, food accessibility, um, which I, I mentioned on that slide um, a few minutes ago. Um, and what the evidence suggests, although it, it is 
relatively scant evidence, but it does suggest that um, these coping and adaptation strategies persisted um, beyond this, this sort of high point of, of Portuguese territorial control when um, the Portuguese were, were quite dominant in, in uh, modern day Zimbabwe, um, as well as, as, as coastal Mozambique. Um, and this has been ascribed to um, two factors, uh, one of which is the, the nature of uh, political organization in um, Southeast Africa, um, which is of course an extreme generalization, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and secondly, the weaknesses of the Portuguese themselves in terms of their uh, um, lack of, of numbers, in terms of their lack of um, central command and so on. Um, but, but those two factors, um, by Newitt and I, I, I kind of subscribe to this argument as well, um, led to a resilience of these local institutions, um, i.e. They, they did not sort of move away <coughs> or, or decline um, simply when, when you had um, colonial dominance, at least pre-19th, 20th century. Um, and this quote here by Newitt sort of suggests that um, comparatively with, with the um, uh, Latin American um, uh, societies that, you know, had there been a, a, a great empire, in this case of, of, of Mutapa, as is shown on this map, the Portuguese indeed uh, believed or, or wrote that um, the Mutapa state was uh, uh, much more um, uh, powerful or much more wide um, spread in its territorial extent than it, than it was. Um, a ruthless conquistador could have uh, overthrown the monarch and seized control of the country, but the small scale uh, segmentary nature of political organization proved far more resilient than the great military monarchies of South America. So various factors have been um, ascribed to this, um, this, this kind of maintenance of those coping and adaptation strategies. And two of those, I think, which are quite important are, are shown here. <clears throat> um, paradoxically, um, although perhaps, perhaps not so much, um, perhaps adaptation innovation are also complementary to, um, in, in some ways, um, elements of resistance and um, rigidity, although they're, they're often not seen in, in such a sense, is um, these these um, rapid um, and quite um, significant transitions in um, food. I'm talking about the second point first. Okay, I'll take a step back. Um, it, most significant as well is the, the kind of adaptability and uh, innovation that was shown in um, the, the combination of um, different kinds of production methods. And this certainly comes out in the, in the data set as well that I've assembled is um, the importance of, of um, flood recession cultivation on the lower Zambezi, um, but also on other rivers like the, the Shire, Save, um, and, and elsewhere um, in Mozambique and further inland. <coughs> um, and this was often mixed, well, it, it was frequently mixed with um, rain-fed cultivation, which allowed multiple harvests per year um, throughout the dry season as well as the rainy season. Um, and here's a quote which, which illustrates that from, from Santos, and there are many, many more. Um, and also, um, what I was just talking about when I was jumping the gun was um, <clears throat> the importance of these um, American crops in particular, which contrasted to wheat, um, which as you can see here on the, the bottom left map here, is that wheat was largely confined to the Zambezi Valley, the Zambezi Delta, um, and some of the coastal areas, it did have, it was reported in, in land um, in the Metapa state in Manuka, that was largely experimental cultivation, but actually it was, it was very much a crop confined to the, the sort of Portuguese colonial land holdings, unlike the two American crops here, which spread um, much further. And um, as the qualitative evidence shows, they became much more important elsewhere, um, much further out from the, the, the um, colonial land holdings. So, and, and I've, I've also tentatively stated that, that these um, crops spread also where pre-existing crop diversity was relatively low. Um, and you can see, for example, on those, those, that bottom panel here on the right, staple trajectories in, um, in uh, Mozambique, the mainland opposite uh, Mozambique Island, and in Maputo Bay, 
you have a transition from uh, large, largely sorghum dependence to, to cassava supplemented by um, sorghum and rice. And around the Puto, you have um, a transition from pearl millet and, and sorghum um, dependence to uh, maize combined with um, rice, sorghum, pearl millet and cassava. <clears throat> What's important to note, um, at least for now, and this is a point that we'll come back to right at the end, is that uh, these crops in, in many cases, um, and certainly cassava, was not simply a um, subsistence crop, it, it was also a saleable commodity and, and in particular it allowed um, women to access markets that um, they hadn't been able to access in previous times, um, for example on, on trade caravan routes but also um, um, uh, uh, various other uh, uh, sort of local um, forms of exchange as well. And, and that was the case in, <coughs> in northern Zambia as well as uh, southern Mozambique as the work of um, Von Oppen and uh, Heidi Gengenbach have shown. And the last um, element of adaptation that I'd also <coughs> like to just briefly dwell on um, also relates to this kind of pre-existing um, uh, organization and uh, distribution relative importance of uh, foodstuffs but in this case of domestic stock um, it's it's not a complete correspondence but there is um, a clustering of domestic stock um, cattle sheep and goats in areas with low tsetse fly um, suitability um, at least according to this data set um, I should have stated there that that's from the um, FAO um, from a couple of decades ago um, so areas like southernmost Mozambique, um, the, the southern bank of the Zambezi near Tet and also the Angonia Highlands. Um, but on the flip side of that, where you have um, uh, reduced quantities of stock, densities of stock, um, evidence of diversification and specialization, um, as well as increased um, use of wild resources, um, we have a lot of evidence of this where domestic stock were, were comparatively few. <clears throat> and in terms of diversification and specialization, I'm talking about um, increased growth of fruit crops, um, but particularly um, production of cotton, um, weaving of cotton, uh, sugar cane cultivation, uh, tobacco production, uh, fishing, particularly um, in the areas north of the, the Zambezi Delta, um, and also salt production and, and other kinds of livelihoods uh, related to that. Um, and often these um, uh, resources, these foodstuffs were exchanged for, for small stock uh, where tsetse fly were a barrier <clears throat> um, in order to access key sources of protein. On the, on the more chronological side, where we have evidence that cattle were lost over time, um, for example, in the uh, 17th century, late 17th century uh, Lutapa state and the northern Zimbabwe plateau, um, there was a shift. Um, the state itself moved to the Zambezi in a, in a, in a tsetse um, infested area. Um, but there was a shift actually of the whole organization of the state towards a more kind of predatory uh, militarism and uh, raiding was something that was um, intensified in times of drought to access protein. So you have um, not just adaptations in, in sort of um, cultivation of, of foodstuffs, the type of foodstuffs, but you also have um, adaptations, um, coping strategies, uh, anew in terms of um, food acquisition as well. Um, <clears throat> and just comparing that more broadly, I think, um, so Joseph Tainter, who, one of the uh, key scholars in the, in the sort of collapse of complex societies literature, um, he stated that it's, it's historically rare for societies to uh, survive by simplifying. Normally societies survive um, by uh, actually adding layers of complexity towards um, their, their organization. But actually this is quite a good example of a society that, that um, lost its sort of monumental architecture, it lost its um, its um, uh, trade power and, and, and so on, um, but actually turn to different forms of, of ways of um, acquiring food. <clears throat> uh, just to finish off on the uh, historical components, I've realized we're 
already at about 45 minutes, but um, getting towards the last few slides here. Um, and I think I'm not going to say too much about this one, but it's just an example to try and draw this back to that drought chronology that I presented, um, because I haven't really spoken about that um, for a while. But um, if we look at one of those severe droughts that was probably the most protracted drought that has actually been recorded um, across the time period that, that I was talking about earlier, um, between 1824 and 31, um, this was an example actually of a, um, a sort of localized collapse um, where, whereby Senna, the old Portuguese capital of, of the Zambezi, was um, virtually abandoned um, and, and most of the old um, colonial system of land holdings broke down completely by 1830. <coughs> um, the link with foodstuffs there is, is um, indirect, um, but actually the, the sort of institutional um, organization of, of the Zambezi society um, was perhaps more significant. As we can see on the right or, or on the left, we see um, evidence of the impacts of that drought on the society. But on the right, we can see over time, just um, before that drought hits, we can see that that's when the, the slave trade um, in, in um, Mozambique started intensifying most rapidly. And um, again, it intensified um, <clears throat> quite substantially over the subsequent years after 1821 as well. Um, and in turn, we can see a, a big drop off in the um, exports of uh, wheat and rice from, from Quelimani as well. So we have very much a shift from, from one sort of um, <clears throat> um, colonial economic um, activity to, to um, uh, in, in terms of commercial food production towards uh, the slave trade, which in turn undermined um, <clears throat> the, the, the production capabilities of, of um, uh, the, the estates on the Zambezi because there were simply less people to actually do the cultivating. Um, and that really um, increased vulnerability relative to other areas of, of the region um, uh, where we have, yes, still evidence of drought causing significant impacts, but perhaps not the complete breakdown of society as a whole. <clears throat> so what does it, what, if we jump forward um, two centuries, so um, there's a reason I'm not saying much about the intervening period, um, which I'll, I'll conclude by mentioning at the end. Um, but if we look at how those patterns of um, food distribution and, and crop cultivation compare with, with more um, modern, more recent periods, uh, we can see that in this map on the left here um, by Reddy of uh, traditional crop zones, uh, which was from 1986, so in the decade after um, independence based on, on, um, on, on the picture then, <clears throat> we see quite a rapid, um, well, not necessarily rapid, but quite a, a significant expansion of um, the two American crops. By then, they were termed traditional crops uh, from their, 17th, their, their 18th century centers of establishment. And related, you have a contraction of, of sorghum millet um, as well. Uh, you have some continuities in, in the distribution of rice, of pearl millet, um, and of sorghum. Um, and wheat, again, you have this um, really this um, almost complete confinement to, to Portuguese colonial um, and commercial farms right from the early colonial um, days through to um, the, the 20th century period. <coughs> um, but what's interesting and what's been uh, alluded to by uh, De Brito and others is that um, in, in areas, some areas of, of um, urban Mozambique, at least, there's been a, a rejection of, of this uh, rural diet around maize and cassava, which has enforced the reliance on, on, on wheat imports. And then if we look at this map on the right, which doesn't, I confess, show much because it's, it's, um, it's all broken down to 26 different uh, legend items, which I'm not going to explain, obviously. Um, but the, the sort of headline figure from that is that maize um, according to <clears throat> this um, livelihood zoning study in, in 2014, um, was grown as a staple in um, each of the 26 zones classified here, cassava in 22 of the 26 zones, sorghum still going relatively strong at 15 out of 26 and, and just three out of 26 um, for millet. Um, and the, the sort of implications of that for food security have been noted um, cassava, whilst high yielding, whilst also drought resistant, um, has lower content of proteins and vitamins. And maize, 
<coughs> whilst also high yielding, um, lacks usable protein and lower B vitamins in, in, in grains like sorghum. And it's also vulnerable to both warming temperatures and uh, drought stress. Something else um, that I would just um, make a, <coughs> a connection to is the um, Kahorabata Dam, which had significant impacts on the um, on, on food systems in the lower Zambezi, um, which is shown uh, on the right and the map in the top right. So this dam was completed in 1974 in the last year of, of uh, Portuguese rule over Mozambique. Um, and it largely supplied um, South Africa with, with um, hydropower. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see there, a quote from the Portuguese overseas minister back then, um, stating that the dam's objective was to tame the world uh, river and transform it into a valuable tool for progress. Um, in doing so, um, it uh, enforced a transition from um, an annual rainy season flood um, between uh, February, March, April, um, going back to the quote from, from Santos earlier from the early 17th century. Um, and in doing so, it reduced the extent of irrigation um, and the fertility of, of the uh, surrounding um, areas of the Zambezi. It also decreased fish habitats, um, which bearing in mind um, uh, this, this area, particularly the Delta area was a, an area where <coughs> historically there were relatively low concentrations of domestic stock um, were important for, for, for protein um, and in fact effectively eroded the whole livelihood base of um, large portions of, of communities that lived um, and live in this area. And if we look at this in, in a very long-term perspective, it's very noticeable how um, the uh, perhaps exaggerated accounts of, of early colonial writers of course seeking to get investment from the uh, Portuguese treasury into the region um, stated that these 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 provinces were the, the the richest the universe has. They were consistently lauding the agricultural potential of of um, the Zambezi and the Lower Zambezi. Has um, transformed in in effect, um, according to this uh, Fusenet 2014 livelihood zoning, into an area of moderate food insecurity, which is um, quite the reversal of fortune. And then finally, I just draw attention to um, some work by uh, Heidi Gengenbach and uh, colleagues in um, the, in, well, one of the, the attempts to address food insecurity has um, involved uh, the integration of farmers into uh, value chains. Um, and one of these is, is uh, cassava um, related to the <coughs> um, Impala um, beer brewed from, from cassava. And this um, in the uh, Zavala province of, of southern Mozambique, <coughs> excuse me, um, as, as Gengenbach uh, refers to, was, was entirely based on this um, idea that cassava was simply a um, subsistence crop um, and that its producers um, lacking commercial nous and experience would, would just accept any price for their crop. Um, and in fact, that, that um, historically was not the reality. Um, evidence before the, the 19th century is, is fragmentary, but we know um, from early 19th century evidence that actually there, there is that history of um, selling processed cassava foods. Um, and modern ethnographic research has, has um, uh, quite um, convincingly um, also uh, confirmed the importance of, of uh, commercial cassava production as well. Um, even more so, um, as Gengenbach has referred to, is that against expectations, um, the income from, from crop sales um, that was realized was actually channeled towards um, socioeconomic um, rather than nutritional bet betterment. Um, and this included, for example, dietary shifts towards processed foods that, that really symbolized class, uh, class status and had done so um, since colonial times. So. Um, really, we're seeing what um, policy interventions without context, uh, cassava without context, as, as um, Heidi um, terms it here, can lead to interventions that um, decrease food security. Um, and clearly, when we're, we're, we're considering climate change adaptation, that is a um, really important element. 
So just to conclude, um, I'm aware that's been slightly longer than 45 minutes, but hopefully not too long. Um, what I hope I've shown, at least started to show in some of these areas, is that by looking into the deeper past, um, we can see how um, resilience um, rather than breakdown was in fact the, the norm. Um, certainly during those um, anomalously dry seasons, um, although some of those protracted events, which are um, interesting to note um, of themselves for their, their, their rare occurrence, um, did pose significant challenges. Um, secondly, that both resistance and adaptability in food systems were important um, and could even be um, operating simultaneously. Um, but points of rupture that occurred during the late 18th century um, and during the modern uh, colonial period and towards the end of it, certainly when we're talking about the Corobasa Dam, um, shifted trajectories of vulnerability to um, completely different baselines. And then, um, yeah, as I've, as I've recently been talking about just at the end there, um, the under this understanding of the deeper history of foodstuffs is, is important to at least contextualize um, attempts to address modern uh, food insecurity. Um, and I mentioned a, a, that gap between 1850, 1840 and, and 20th century. Well, that's something I'm hoping to fill in this new um, British Academy small grant that uh, recently been awarded with uh, David Nash and uh, Barbara Dorato um, to look at uh, the climate history of Mozambique during the 19th century. Um, so with that, thank you very much for listening and happy to take any questions. Matt, sincere thanks for that. Um, I, I think you, you've given everybody in the audience a, a sort of a real tour of, of many hundreds of years using a, a, such a wide array of data. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to invite everybody in the audience, if, if they have any questions, to post them in the Q&A. But whilst you're perhaps thinking of those questions, uh, sort of the two threads of which I posted, and one was on behalf of somebody in the audience, is perhaps something that is absolutely relevant to some of the things you've been talking about. But I shall read it rather than name them. But of course, you can follow up. And it says, congrats on compiling drought evidence. I have newspaper clippings about the drought in Mozambique uh, from 1926 to 2021. So there's potentially an opportunity there for further investigation, and we can certainly pass that on. But, but my question to start was really sort of reflecting on your methods and approaches to construct your, uh, your database of evidence, which you shared some analyses of. And no doubt, given the, the multiple lines of evidence, the, the, the process of translating and corroborating that into a single entity is, is highly complex. So could you perhaps share with us, and I know you, I wrote this literally before you put your flowchart up, so that might in, indeed address the question, but can, can you tell us about the processes that you've gone through to create that single entity and, and sort of what challenges that pose and what forward opportunities may exist? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and I, I, yeah, I must stress that this is not published yet, so any, any feedback is obviously, as always, uh, more than welcome. Um, but this arose really as a byproduct of, as, as things often do, of other um, research questions. Um, and um, one of the things um, I've, I've come across is that um, there's not much of this work that's being done with written sources. It's, it's often left to archaeologists, paleoecologists to, to fill in the gaps. And then you have this big gap um, going forward to the, to the modern period. Um, one of the other challenges that um, this has come with is I have, I've had to be mindful of um, sort of compiling this, not just for the questions that I'm trying to answer, but of, of wider interest um, that, that can be um, gleaned from, from the data. So I've, I've spent a lot longer than I perhaps would have done um, in, um, in, in doing this otherwise. Um, and, but in terms of the, the major challenges, I think, um, identifying locations has been a, a real challenge. Um, so historical data, certainly from outsiders, um, pretty much all of this was written by um, uh, Europeans, um, at least in that period, um, is identifying um, place names, uh, 
that's taken an extremely long time. Um, and I've taken inspiration from sort of other data sets in, in terms of acknowledging uncertainty and um, being transparent about classifications, because I think that's that's something that actually the sort of this generation of scholars are perhaps doing a bit um, more convincingly than um, earlier generations in terms of um, you know providing those the, the the rationale behind classifications and so forth. Um, and then I'd say the other challenge, as I alluded to, was um, getting into all the debates around the, the changing um, terminologies for foodstuffs, um, even within languages, not to mention between languages. Um, so Portuguese um, language material is the um, was the main uh, constituent of the data set. But then you have um, the British coming in in the 1820s and simply referring to millet um, rather than the specific terms for pearl millet or finger millet. So one has to think about, you know, the, the adding a, a level of data that's um, that really can only fit what is stated in the documents as well um, and simply acknowledging the uncertainties. So I say those are a few of the, the sort of standout um, standout challenges and the other one that i would say is from a practical perspective big qualitative data is is extremely um time intensive and often you know I, i've been working on this project um with a couple of collaborators but in fact i've been leading this myself um th this database itself and it is often in in the sort of more qualitative fields that you have um less big collaborations. So there are real challenges that um, come with that and um, actually compiling the data, um, putting it into standardized formats, reading the documents is, is an enormous time investment. And um, yeah, the challenges for that speak to themselves. Thank you, Matt. Um, we've, we've, we've got a few more questions and I, I, will, I will take one that's come in before I hand over to my colleague, Jim Jeffers. So th this member of the audience just says um, to have data here in Mozambique is extremely difficult. Uh, what sources did you use for temperature data, uh, rainfall and old documents from the colonial period? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's, it's a great one. Um, so the, te the, the, very, uh, the earliest data I've used is from um, just narrative written records. Um, those can be things like chronicles, um, which refer to key events um, from the history of Eastern Africa. Um, some of these are diaries um, written by um, uh, travelers, colonial governors. Um, others are um, at least briefly um, in the 1720s for Maputo. We have um, sources from the Dutch. Um, uh, daily registers that were kept there. So um, we have a, a sort of consistent span of um, daily entries of, of uh, rain and of wind. Um, so I've relied on that kind of mixture of sources for the period that I've been looking at, which is before 1840. Um, but as we go beyond there, we have more um, mission stations. Um, so I think those have uh, real value for um, for, for, for climate reconstruction, um, as, as David Nash and others have shown. Um, and then in the 1880s, 1890s, we start to get um, uh, weather diaries and early instrumental data, um, uh, some of which is um, kept uh, in, well, various archives, but some of that is available in, in data sets like the 20th century reanalysis, um and um on the global historical climatology network as well um so there's a range of sources and in fact compiling all those into one time series is, is a is a challenge and something that i hope to be working on um in, in the new project but uh as to your other points as well about the newspaper clippings yeah i'd be really interested to to hear about that um i think it's it would be interesting as well to compare that source from uh with the the instrumental data as well and see um, yeah, what you, what you get. 
Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague Jim, who's who's posted a, a number of questions. <coughs> Thanks, Rich. Yeah, I suppose my, my, my questions are sort of, in some ways, classic questions that that, uh, that that come up when we start talking about this sort of research, but I'd just be curious to, to kind of hear a bit more about your thoughts on them in the context of this work, and I'll, I'll, th I'll throw both of them at you at once. Um, one was you mentioned, you know, reaching the point of diminishing returns with, 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 with the archives, and I, I know it's certainly something that I've thought about when, when, when using archival sources is to try to decide, okay, when's the best time to stop, you know, and, and, and when do I keep going? So I suppose one would just to hear a bit more of your thoughts on, in the context of this work on, on the sort of challenges and opportunities of, of archival research. And then the, the other is just a bit more on the, on the sort of classic question for this sort of work is, you know, what do, the, do these examples of resilience in the deep past offer lessons that are applicable today? And if so, how do we kind of extract and apply those lessons given the huge differences in, in historical context? Again, it's a kind of a classic question for this sort of research, but just in the context of this work, curious to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks for that, Jim. Um, yeah, the first question, um, it's something I struggle with as well, and indeed, probably one of the reasons why I haven't published this uh, other database yet is that um, is, is that I've I've kept going, and you know, just one more source. And, um, but I, I think I really have reached the point where um, where you know the 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 sources that I could add would maybe add one or two observations each, but they're not going to change the overall picture. <coughs> um, with respect to the the, the climate reconstruction, um, I I'm I'm less certain that um, other single season droughts might not pop up, um, but I'm fairly convinced that most of those very severe um, and very protracted droughts that lasted three, four, five years um, have been captured. Um, at least the ones that uh, survive in the archives that are um, that were written about in the first place. There may be there may be gaps for other reasons um, that uh, there aren't easy answers to. Um, one of the the caveats to that is that I haven't been to the um, the archive in in Goa, um, where there is some uh, there's um, some data that may add bits and pieces. But again, some of that. Um, some, of, some of the key documents from that archive have been already um, retrieved, published, um, at least the ones that don't just concern um, Portuguese administration, but actually talk about the, the region itself. Um, but of course, if I publish this and, and then somebody else um, writes a response or, or, or finds some new data, then I'm happy to stand corrected. Um, in terms of your second question, um, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of hesitant about <clears throat> extracting lessons and sort of um, transplanting them into a completely different context. I think that word context is really um, what I've been trying to do here, um, because as you say, um, there, are, there are very, very significant differences between societies past and present, not least with the kinds of time depths we're talking about here. Um, and so providing context to um, food systems before colonial times um, is something that's really important, I think, because some of the key um, strategies for combating um, and increasing adaptive capacity involve re-adopting um, indigenous grains, um, indigenous um, uh, foodstuffs like uh, Bambara groundnut, um, which um, other scholars have shown elsewhere have um, very strong socio-cultural meanings, um, taboos in some cases, like in, in northern Malawi. Um, so I think reviving and retrieving this this sort of deeper history of, um, of foodstuffs and these deeper environmental histories can help provide that context in which, in the case of the cassava value chain, was clearly sorely lacking. Um, and those kinds of policy interventions can do um, quite significant damage um, if they're not contextualized. So I'd say context is, is the key um, here. Um, obviously, I've written about this with um, 
George, who's here, um, Eleanor Rowland as well. And there's been much published in, in recent uh, years on this as well. Um, but I don't think that the, the, um, the goal is to sort of find lessons and then apply them to, to very specific um, areas for, in terms of you know, responding um, or individual adaptation strategies. It's really about context. Thank you, Matt. I'm, I'm just looking at the questions. I'm not seeing any more come in, but of course I, I do extend a final invitation to anybody in the audience if they, if they have that burning question they would like to pose. Deborah, please speak. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Matthew. It was very interesting. Um, you're talking about a region that I grew up in, so it's even more fascinating. Thank you. I just um, know this, this research is specific, but also wide. Uh, were there any um, forms of sources from military records, for example, from the First World War going forward into the, the Bush War of the 1970s? Uh, something I, it's slightly out of my time frame. <laughs> it's too recent for me. Um, I haven't I haven't looked into any of those sources, um, but but there probably will be, I imagine. Um, so I'm sort of creeping up gradually to the, the late nineteenth century. So it's sort of bordering that that time period, but it could be something that's that's um, that's quite relevant to uh, look thank into. Thank you. Yeah, that was really you, interesting. Deborah. Uh, any final questions, folks? Well, if not, can I pass back to my colleague, uh, Jim Jeffers, to, to sort of close our session for this afternoon? Thanks, Richard. Really just to say um, thank you to, to Matt for a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I'm super impressed by what you're trying to do and all the threads that you're that you're bringing together and, and, and the depth and, and, and complexity of, uh, of, of what you've been engaging with is really impressive. And, and also just to say a particular thank you for, for doing this while you're recovering your voice. Um, because uh, I didn't lose my voice in the last couple of weeks, but I've been coughing and spluttering and, and, and quite hoarse. So um, I'm, uh, I don't know if I would have managed a 45 minute talk. So um, th thank you particularly for, for, for doing it in that context and for, um, for getting our, our series this year off to, uh, to a really great start. Um, just to mention for, for everybody in the audience that our next event is on Wednesday the 16th of November. And we have um, Professor Oliver Cornup from the University of Potsdam in Germany, and he will be speaking on natural hazards learning under uncertainty. So um, please do consider joining us for that and, uh, and, and subsequent events. Um, so with that, just to say thank you once again to, to Matt. Um, and uh, I think that, that wraps things up for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much to both of you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. All right. That closes this afternoon, ladies and gents. Thank you. Bye-bye.